Hey everybody, welcome to VR Game Nights. My name is Greta Gamer, and my co-host, as always, is here, is Sir Aga. How you doing, Agasca, please? Good, Greg. How are you? I am uh, doing great, and I'm looking forward to talking about the post-E3 with you, because yes. E3 is all done. Last right, week we, we were in the middle of it, in the middle of technical issues and all kinds of crazy stuff, but now it's over. Yes. Yeah. Not a, not a horrible arrangement because E2KG was we were submerged underwater trying to swim through everything that got announced for for conventional traditional gaming stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, uh, it wasn't a bad mix to uh, to come back to this week later. I think I've heard every single noise that could happen <laughs> while you were talking. Phone buzzing, jingling. It's like just say like Alexa. <laughs> Like I, really honestly, like, I really honestly don't even know, like, what's... Oh, popular. see, I have my Alexa open. Hey, Alexa. <laughs> yes, fortunately, my, the, the, my Echo that's down here is actually has a different uh, uh, wake word than that one. <laughs> oh, hold on. My Alexa's actually doing something. Alexa, stop. <laughs> Alexa. The wonders of technology. Stop. Not only do you get virtual reality, but you get virtual assistance on this show as well. I didn't even I forgot I had an Alexa here. So we're gonna start the whole show over again. You ready? Sure. Hey everybody, welcome to the VR Game Nights. It's Sir Gray and Sir Aga back to talk about all the news and happenings this week in VR. And um we're especially excited to talk about all the stuff that happened at E3. Now, we're not going to talk about anything non-VR. We're going to focus on virtual reality because that's what we do. But I know, Sir Aga, you guys over at E2KG had your hands full because there was a lot of non-VR stuff going on, right? That is correct. It's really, uh, it's, man, it's so weird. I I, I'm, I need to talk to the guys. Next week, you know, we we all kind of went into this E3 feeling like, oh, this is a transition year, you know, there's not going to be that much going on. And I tell you, as I thought about it um, during my commutes this week, I was like, I think this is actually one of the most exciting years in gaming right now, because um, I don't, I don't, I can't remember a point in history other than, other than maybe the transition from 16 to 32 bit where there's so much uncertainty. Like we don't know what's going to happen with, games as a service we don't know what's going to happen with streaming services we don't know what you know that there's wildly different theories in what the impact of of game streamers is upon the market so it's just a really interesting time and in each of the companies is reacting and responding differently and it's making it pretty exciting you know i saw an article that said the winner of e3 2019 was 2020 and the loser, <laughs> the loser of E3 2019 was 2019. Yeah. It well, kind of a... felt like everybody was saying, this is coming in 2020. Well, so we, uh, yeah, and I won't dive too dumpster deep on, on this. I will say one thing I regret partially. So last year uh, in our E3 coverage on E2KG, we were very hyper-specific in maintaining metrics. And the reason for that is because in years past, um, we would discuss E3, we would talk about how we felt, and then when I would actually go back and look at numerical data, I'd be like, you know, so, you know, as a, for instance, this year, we would all say, there's nothing coming out in the fall, there's nothing coming out in the fall. When you actually go back and look at the list of all of the release dates, it, I don't. I strongly suspect that a lot of times we feel a way, and that's not the way it actually is. Um, in particular, you know, we with the way we split the show up, a lot of the shows that we covered on part one were the companies that said 2020, 2020, 2020. But then when you look at the shows we covered in part two, which were like Nintendo and Ubisoft and Bethesda um, and Square Enix, there's a, t first of all, there's a ton of games that are releasing right now, like this month, July and August, far more than normally we get in the summer months. Uh, and then, and then there's there is a chunk of stuff coming out in the fall. So we didn't do metrics this year because it's really burdensome. But I I, I regret that because I really do want to see those numbers. Um, but I, I mean, there's so I don't know. There, there's some neat things coming out uh, in the fall, and I'm very excited to see what those things offer. If we look at the um, the upload VRs, you know, 3D, you know, VR showcase, right? Right. 
like almost everything was coming in 2019, right? So as far as a VR user, it was like this huge dump. It's like all this stuff is coming this fall. And I was like, wow. Yeah. It's so, <laughs> so the upload VR v, v, E3 VR show, the biggest thing takeaway I have from that show is VR does not showcase well as a, as an E3 press conference, as a video in 2d. Like this, and this has historically been the problem with VR. It's one of the reasons I laid off of that pitch right for so long, is you like you can't. It doesn't quite frankly. I mean, really, it doesn't look good right on a on a on a two D plane. And the only reason I think we get something out of those presentations now is because we we have a better sense of when we see something in a two D plane what it's going to look like inside the headset. But still, now it, there was also it, there also might be some some website stuff where just I know when I viewed the video, which I think was the day of the press conference, I just did it time delayed. It was only available on YouTube in 360p, so that's a huge problem, right? You're catering to the, the group of people who are literally um, like they're the gamers who already have everything. Right, so you can't cater them. I mean, quite frankly, that video should have been in 4K, right? If at all feasible. Yeah. So, and I, I get it; it's a small website on a limited budget, but but that was definitely part of the uptake. But just like I think, I'm hoping that they think about it. I think there has to be a different way that that gets conveyed to VR enthusiasts because I just don't. I didn't. I I didn't really get anything out of like those those presentations i always love it i always love it when you hear from the developers that to me is the most important thing out of those um but but the visual presentations i'm like this is like didn't didn't do anything for me well i I gotta jump in here i mean something and i don't understand what youtube's doing we were talking about this in the pre-show you know they're huge i mean they're literally huge right and and some of these things and i actually got a link to a survey for YouTube and I'm like, guys, you know, I streamed something the night before, you know, I want to go in, I want to take out the dead spots. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll have technical issues before or in the middle of your stream. So you download it, you edit it and you re-upload it. Right. And you know, 12 hours later, their, their service have only rendered it the 360p. It's like, guys, I streamed this in 1080. Could you please let me download it in 1080? I mean, I understand you're not going to allow me to edit it on your site. Just let me download the raw video and re-upload it. Right? And it's something janky what they've been doing the last couple of months. Never a problem. You know, the our channel goes back four or five years. Never been a problem to recently. So that's one piece. But then we get to the other piece because... And I really, I really, really want to say to the Upload VR guys, I really appreciate what you guys tried to do. Really appreciate that. But I was hoping that they went out and interviewed, like, each dev before they showed the trailer instead of just combining a bunch of trailers together with a guy petting a PSVR. I mean, it's like, I understand you can't give us too much original content. But at least give us some original interviews. That's what you do. You're a news story. You know, you're... I mean, maybe they can show, like, a little bit of the clip that they didn't show before, but... Sorry, I got a cold. But, um, yeah, I kind of... I, I still enjoyed it, but... There was this whole section where it was just PSVR, and I'm like... You know, I'm typing in the chat. I said this last week. Z, Z, Z. It's like... I don't have a PSVR. It's a... For me... PSVR is great, but for me it would be a step back. I have a, a PS4 Slim, but you like I have a Rift. Everything I've read said it's a step down. So to those people who have it, awesome. But if you could like front load that or back load that and just let me know, because that's not going to interest me, you know. So, um, anyways, I, I thought it was good. I th- but here's the thing, like one of the videos, and I forget the name. We talked about it last week, but they had a lot of stuttering in their video. And I'm like, this is your E3 video. You couldn't get the most powerful computer in the office to render this gameplay. You just gave us like, it was gorgeous, but some of the video was stuttering. It was like, come on, man, spend a couple of dollars, you know? 
But. Yeah, and I mean, and, and this is, I think, what Whitney says. I mean, years back, we'll look back on this and we'll be like, oh man, remember the first VR showcase, like, and how, you know, rough it was. And I, I think, unfortunately, this is us seeing, you know, an, an, an immature niche sector of the industry trying to crawl up to the level playing field, right? I, first of all, I think all of the publishers can learn something from. E3's, or E3, from EA's approach to EA Play, where there was a published agenda, right? Now, again, everybody, I mean, I personally still like a press conference. I didn't, I was fine with EA's approach to it because that was the best thing for EA to do. Um, I don't, I don't want all the publishers to do 30 minute blocks, right, of each game, um, you know, because they only have three or four games. Um, but there's something to be said of what you mentioned, you know, but, but when it's, when it's a showcase, right. And it's, it's not necessary. You're not really keeping any secrets, right. You could put a, out a high level agenda that just said first 20 minutes or piece or, or rift, you know, second 20 minutes or PSVR last 20 minutes or vive or something, right. To, to keep people from, from having to sit through things. That being said, I, I get, I get, upload VR's approach because as far as we can tell from the sales data, the PSVR is the most populous skew of VR headset out in the wild right now. Um, and, and from an affordability perspective, um, it's, it's what a lot of people went after because they had PlayStations. They didn't have $1,000 plus PCs with GTX GPUs inside of them, unfortunately. So, so, so from a certain perspective, I get that, but yeah, it's just it's just going to be a struggle. This is like I said, you know, for years we sat and heard from all of the game journalists who were going out to these conferences and getting a chance to put HMDs on and play in virtual rea- virtual reality, and 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 the audience split. Right, there were some people who believed what they heard the journalists say. There were some of us who were like, well, I don't believe it and i don't care about it until i can see it or touch it because you know the way they talk about it i'm like part this sounds partially like a myth right and i just don't i just don't buy it so upload vr i mean for what for you know all that we've said upload vr took on a very big challenge um and i and as i sit here and, and i've tried to think about it i i don't i don't know of a great way to surmount that but Man, but the but the but the first swing definitely just didn't put across the things that it needs to, um, and and it's not even on upload VR. Like it's a hard thing in general to pitch these games, right? Like what? Like it's, yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't know. It's tough. Yeah, I think I think what's needed is a like an independent VR marketing conglomeration. So. Everybody who's making VR games, vendors who make the hardware, the the game companies, the magazines like Upload VR or the websites like Upload VR and Road to VR and all that, they should come together and and create an entity that can do this. So that Upload and Road to and VR Scout and all these people can like, they can be like the game spots and the IGNs and whatever, kind of like, you know, prepping for this industry VR, you know, conglomerate. But, you know, I think what they did was great. I'm glad they did it. I appreciate them and all the hard work they put into it. And I hope, hopefully next year they can take up, you know, go on on the lever from that. Now, having said that, but kind of focused on that whole presentation so far, do you have any other E3 kind of wrap-up things you want to talk about? And not specifically, I'm going to shy away from, like I said, the conventional game and, and traditional gaming stuff. Uh, the last little bit I have is the games that did catch my eye at the VR showcase. Um, those were uh, The Walking Dead Onslaught, which comes out fall of this year. Um, I found that very interesting, the perspective of it. So as far as I understand, you're actually playing the characters in the TV show um, or some subset of them. Um so, you know, if now what you didn't see in that is, are there NPCs in that world? If there are NPCs in that world and they look good and they, it makes you feel like you're in like a, you know, one of the AMC's, the Walking Dead series episodes, 
that will be great. Um, shooter mechanics looked fine. Um, you know, a, a, a potential to put across, you know, what, what could be a very chilling, um, and the walking dead is obviously not a, not a very happy, shiny show. Um, so if they can convey that in VR, um, that, that might be awesome. I think in order to do that, they really need to have the drama there. It can't just be the mechanics. Um, of course, again, as we talk about this, I don't know that VR has enough market uptake that they would have grabbed, um, you know, Rick Grimes, Michonne, and Daryl, right, and, and had them come in and do mocap for a VR game. Uh, we'll just have to see. Uh, I was also interested in Arizona Sunshine for the Oculus Quest, which also comes out this year, not pegged to a certain date. Um, pretty much all that's left is summer and fall. So if they, if they say 2019, I would assume it's fall 2019. Um, so again, yet another zombie apocalypse survival game. Uh, what, what excited me the most is that it's coming to Quest, which means you're going to be able to stand up and walk around uh, and play that game. Um, and then the other two were Aspire 1 VR Operative, which comes out in August on all platforms, including uh, the Quest. Um, and then... I can't. I'm, I'm actually having a hard time visualizing that game in my head. I'll probably uh, uh, look it up uh, uh, when you go. The last one I thought was very inter uh, interesting was Pistol Whip, who I can't remember the studio that's doing this. It's a studio, uh, the creative director is somebody who's familiar, but um, it's kind of like uh, a shooter on rails. So you're always progressively moving forward. But what it has to it is it has this. Um, uh, man, I can't, I mean, I remember the, ex exactly get the name of the game, but it's, it's like Crisis Cop or something, but it's a big stand-up arcade cabinet, light gun game, and the way that you play it is whenever you step on the pedal, uh, or whenever you take your foot off the pedal, I think you pop up out of cover. So as long as your foot's on the pedal, um, it's, it's kind of a Rainbow Six Vegas kind of presentation where you're crouched behind cover, and then, uh, her... No, I think it's when you point the light gun at the screen. I think you point the light gun off the screen and they take cover and then you point the light gun at the screen and they pop up. And then the pedal, I think, is what you use to reload or it's something like that. Um, but the point is, is it, it feels, it's it's to me, it's very immersive. And this game kind of feels spiritually uh, the same. Um, you're on rails, but you're you're able to move and like dodge incoming projectiles and things like that um and then obviously then you have kind of that that gun ballet gun play in there as well uh with the touch control so uh so yeah i mean one two three like four titles at least that caught my eye to to keep an eye on um throughout as you mentioned this year uh pistol whip did not get dated um but the other three games did uh i heard somebody call uh pistol whip it's kind of like beat saber and super hot combined and yeah, I, I kind of get that. I kind of get that vibe from it too. Not a game that I probably pick up, but uh, it looked pretty cool, and there's a lot of excitement around it. There is. Um, let's talk about some of our news stories now that we're done with E3, and I'm going to go ahead and switch over to this first one, which I believe is about the uh, Rec Room guys. Let me uh, pull that up here on the screen here, and um, pretty interesting, pretty interesting story. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so so this is about um, against gravity. Who who are the buddy who has a knows of for many of us your VR um, because it's an easy thing to get into minus all the account sign up stuff and then finding your friends. Um, but those are growing pains. Um, but uh, against gravity apparently has been running on like five million dollars uh, for the last few years. They just completed a successful round of um, uh, where they raised $24 million in Series A and Series B funds. Uh, there's a lot in this article that speculates, I'm sorry, by the way, we uh, we sourced this article from uh, Road to VR. Um, there's a lot of speculation in this article that talks about uh, how this might uh, look and make, or this might look uh, as a competitive move to Facebook, but while, Rec Room is definitely a, a social VR experience, partially. Um, and Facebook obviously has designs on social experiences. I think they're wildly different things. I think, I don't, so first of all, I don't feel like Facebook has made a social VR move yet. I think that they are hanging Except for buying Oculus. Well, but I mean, 
but I mean, as far as actual Software. technical implementation goes, right? I, I mean, you know, there's they are working on um, a, a browser implementation, which we've talked about before. You know, trying to champion of uh, a, a, a basically an, uh, a VR spec um, for the web, uh, which I think would be great. Um, but uh, I don't, I don't feel like these two things. I mean, Rec Room has social aspects to it, but it is a highly gamified experience. Um, when Facebook makes its true social move, I don't think that that's going to be gamified, right? There'll be, sure, there'll be progression elements to it, but at the end of the day, Facebook's VR move is going to be about connecting people and staying in touch with your friends in VR, um, not about playing laser tag. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's cool. Uh, it's very interesting. You know, we, you know, you and I definitely um, kind of got our start, right? The, like the, the, the birthing notions of this show kind of started in Rec Room. Yeah. Um, so it might be interesting to see what they do with that 24 mil. And if they, uh, you know, you and I have gone on to, I guess what I would say are more detailed experiences um, in things like Elite Dangerous, Star Trek Bridge Crew, um, you know, racing games and things like that. So it'll be interesting if they use that 24 million to develop something that, um, you know, has a slightly different presentation factor, higher fidelity physics model, things like that, things that might encourage people who, initially onboarded with Rec Room, but then graduated to other experiences to, to give us a reason to come back. You know, this may not be a popular opinion, but I kind of feel like Rec Room is the VR version of Roadblocks. I mean, it seems like... <clears throat> excuse me. It seems like, uh, like Rec Room is just super popular. Like, when I would play it with my grandkids, I could not get them to do a quest. They just wanted to horse around with the random people they were meeting in Rec Room. And it seems like that's what they love to do in Roblox when they're playing on their iPads and whatnot. And um, I don't I don't see the business model there. Um, I, I actually think Rec Room has done a great job of creating the Oasis, except it's for, you know, K through 6. You know what I'm saying? It's it's cartoony graphics. It's very I mean it's great. I mean it's fun. It's it's wholesome. But it would be great if there was an adult version. I'm not saying R rated or anything like that, but you know, with 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 more advanced graphics and hey, let me buy a home, let me um invite people over, let me outfit it, you know, but also let me walk out the front door and go to the rec center or go to the laser tag court but let's make the graphics more more you know modern you know and less cartoony um but in any case i wish them a lot of luck i mean they have a fun game i mean i think it's free but um yeah i really think like we talked last time they really should do microtransactions i know all these kids would be asking their parents to let me buy a dress or let me buy a, a jacket or you know, for a buck here, a buck there. I mean, there's no harm, right? So, um, but I don't. But don't, don't they have? Don't they have something? I mean, because you can custom, but you buy those with like in-game currency that you earn, right? But I, I always thought, I guess I always that you could buy that in-game currency um, and still purchase those things. But I, I, I don't know. I I avoid um, spending money like microtransactions so if they have it in there i i didn't see it because i wouldn't i wouldn't look for it but um i i don't you know you you get rewards for playing you unlock things you get you know you do certain challenges you unlock things right which is great but you know i wish them a lot of luck i hope they have a lot of success but you know we were talking in the pre-show like i was i was always the one who was saying yeah you could buy your books on amazon pretty cheap but they lose money every year, so how long is that going to last? Right. You can see how right. worried I was about that. <laughs> right. Hey, the next story we have up here, I'm going to switch over to the uh, to the screen here. It's about the um, Reverb, which has gotten some great reviews. Um, it looks like, uh, you know, we're waiting until July to get restocked, and there's been some, uh, some issues with the quality. Some of the people who have received their units have had some issues. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that article or not, but um, yeah. So, so one of the things, the first thing that I would, I, I may try and pull the thread on this later. I don't know right off the top of my head. I'm highly curious which HP 
is doing this headset? Are, are these the consumer guys or are these the enterprise guys? Because, of course, the companies split um, two or three years ago. Um, so I don't know which HP house is is doing this. They talk about the Reverb being, and, and, the, and the, Reverb, the Reverb Pro in particular, being aimed at, uh, at enterprise customers. So um, very curious. I, I'm not sure where that division landed, but... But yeah, so ever since the release of this headset, they have been challenged by uh, by stock issues. Um, they, I guess, they ceded an initial supply to retail chains um, in very late um, in very late May. Um, but then HP was skittish about actually um, being transparent on on when stock was going to be available, uh, and then. As, as late as recently as mid-June, um, there was another round of stock that was available up on hp.com, but that quickly sold out. Um, and they talk about additional, the next round of stocking should happen sometime in July and be available from HP, Amazon, and Best Buy. Uh, in the meantime, on Reddit, there are a group of Reverb owners who have aggregated in a subreddit to talk about display issues um, that they're having to try and pool that data and get it to HP so that HP can figure out what the problem is. Uh, I got news for you, Refurb owners, you're not the only ones, right? Uh, it seems like every HMD that launched this spring um, has some issue. So uh, other than the Quest, um, I haven't I haven't heard about a lot of things, but of course, you know, where the rubber meets the road on this in many cases appears to be these uh, systems that have to integrate with PCs and the various pieces of hardware there. Uh, although I don't think that the wide variety of hardware components is what's really causing the issue. This sounds like a just basic global um, problem that, that every vendor, um, you know, HTC, Oculus, the Windows manufacturers are having issues with pulling together a, a good set of drivers and a good VR implementation that um, that's commensurate with the cost of these systems. Yeah, I think. I don't know if you read on this, Gray. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm going to guess that um, this is a new display, the 2K by 2K. Um, I'm going to guess that quality is letting let some of the let some slip through, or they were they they tested great in quality and then degraded in the field. It's, it does sound like a percentage of the displays are uh, tinted, are not performing up to expectations, but it's a new display. I think this is the first implementation of this display in a commercial product. Uh, you know, I, you know, reading, you go back to the early Oculus stuff, they talked about how they rejected so many, you know, lenses and displays that they got, you know, from me, you know, they, the, the vendors sent them in, they didn't use all of them, you know, so it's very easy for that type of component. I mean, we all know the red ring of death, right? It's very easy for components to come in past QC, but then, but not be up to the standards of the company. So I hope they get it together. I mean, all the reviews of people who have gotten good units have been superb, especially if you're a, if you're a sim person, like space sim, racing sim, whatever, you know, DCS, whatever. Um, you know, this is the you know a, a leap above what we've had. But um, you know, except for the tracking, of course. But uh, you know, I wish them well. I hope it. I hope it turns out good. I know a lot of people are very excited about this headset. So I'm looking at our next uh, story here. I'm gonna let me pull it up on the screen here. This is the one about. Um, hmm. Well, you want to talk about this one? This yeah, the removal of Steam VR streaming software from Quest app. Yeah, so there was a article uh, last was an article that uh, sort of, um, where uh, information got out that there was an app, um, and I thought it was I thought it was an app that you had to sideload, but this says that it was allowed right into the Quest Store, um, but it was a virtual desktop app, and of course we've all seen this app that allows you to uh, access your PC's desktop. Um, and then, and then streams it over Wi-Fi to the Quest. 
uh, the developer, uh, Guy Godin, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, um, then implemented an additional feature without, sounds like, being very vocal about it um, that would uh, allow in that stream you to actually put your game content uh, from Steam VR uh, across into the Quest headset, thereby basically allowing kind of a, a, a jerry-rigged implementation of a mobile gaming headset that could receive full PC gaming content uh, into the headset. Uh, of course, you know, I and I think you mentioned, Gray, that you read some reviews that said this was, uh, excuse me, like a wonky, uh, not great implementation. Well, I think that was something separate. I'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, okay. okay. Um, so, uh, but at any rate, uh, Oculus then asked him to pull the feature. So, in my opinion, he's kind of lucky. Like you know, in the in in uh, in the Play Store for Google or uh, the App Store for iTunes, uh, this whole app would have just been pulled. Right? <laughs> like you know, it would have suddenly gone unavailable. Um, so it's kind of nice uh, that um, that that Oculus was a little more even handed in their approach and said, "Hey, man, you just gotta pull this feature. It's you know, it's not in accordance with our terms." Um, and uh, you know, it's it's not the way that we would want to enable that functionality. Um, one would think that Oculus, if they were going to do that, would want to enable that functionality via a partnership with Valve um, and do it as a first-party implementation rather than having um, an independent developer do that. Um, so you were going to mention a story that was similar to this? Well, you know, let me talk about this for a minute because I struggle with this. I struggle. Let's go back. I don't know, three months. Valve had an app for for iOS that allowed you. It was kind of like their, you know, their. It allowed you to stream your games to your iOS device. Now, really, what it was was remote desktop, and there were already dozens of remote desktop apps on iOS. They just thought they would make it a little easier, you know, make it a kind of remote desktop just for Steam. And, um, you know, it was reported widely, widely in the press. And it lasted a couple of days until Apple pulled it and said, nope, can't do that. And Valve was like, we don't understand why it's just remote desktop. And I have to agree with them, just because it remote desktops to their, their client. It's remote desktop is remote desktop, right? If you can remotely control your PC from your app, it doesn't matter if it gives you the whole desktop or it just gives you the Steam interface. That's my opinion. Um, you know, you can use Microsoft Office on iOS. Why can't you use Steam on iOS? But anyways, I digress. So that, to me, was just a sign of Apple saying you know what, people will stop buying games from us because they'll just buy them from you. And uh, it's was, it was kind of sad. It was really sad. It's kind of like PlayStation saying, no, you can't play Rocket League with other people because that would that would be dangerous. It's like, it's like really? Are you really kidding me? But uh, in any case, this was very similar where you know, virtual desktop was on the Quest. Oculus said, yep, yeah, yeah, why not? Hey, use your Quest, access your PC. And then he says, okay, and and one of those apps will be Steam. It's like, oh, no, that app you can't access. It's like, really? Are you really going to say, well, you can do virtual desktop, but you must block all these apps we don't like? That's not how it works. Either you approve virtual desktop or you don't. You know, so the the author ended up pulling out the the special feature that made it so much easier and you know supported Steam. Quite honestly, I don't understand. You know, if you're virtual desktop, just stream my PC's desktop. Don't do anything else, and I should be able to play any game, whether it's Steam, GOG, I don't care. But um, in any case, it's very frustrating. It's kind of like doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, you know. If you're going to allow a virtual desktop app, then you're going to allow every single PC app that it's going to be able to use, including Steam and GOG and everybody else. So maybe they just made it a little too easy 
Well, I, I, I think this is where... because it wasn't it wasn't in VR. It was it was yeah. it was just two D. Yeah, I think this is one of those things. Um, you know, the eager beaver, innovative engineer runs into the business model, right? And and where companies are trying to funnel people to down specific corridors in order to monetize. You know, the the problem becomes, you know, of course the person making you know writing the terms of service didn't understand that. Well, I'll just RDP into the thing and. Uh, like I'm on the desktop, right? And I can access any content that's there on the desktop. So I'll just send over Steam VR. Um, you know, but but there are there are things I, I feel like there are things like this that get a lot of bad press, but but now we commonly accept, right? This to me isn't unusual, isn't more isn't entirely different from the people who first got VPN clients so they could come out of a tunnel somewhere where content was licensed that wasn't available in their country not maybe illegal but you know vpns aren't illegal right but but nobody foresaw that that technology could be used as a workaround to get access to something that business model wise they weren't supposed to have access to um now we commonly accept that no it's not it's not you're not allowed to use a VPN to tunnel out and pop up in Italy to see, you know, a movie made by an Italian company that's licensed and released in Italy, but, you know, has it doesn't have a licensing deal to be shown in the United States. You know, we we accept that that's a constraint. So, um, and it's a, it's an unfortunate, you know, speed bump, you know, on the on the path through innovation to leveling out business models, but. Uh, yeah, I like I said, I felt that the guy was fortunate that he, the whole app didn't just get taken down. Um, yeah, and, and to me too, it's it's also vastly different. Again, I, I gotta look at this through the eyes of, of Oculus being owned by Facebook. I, I'm a little more forgiving for Oculus doing it. They're small, VR doesn't have a huge uptake. They're still trying to kind of find footing. When Apple does it, they're just doing it to, you know, to leverage their corporate you know, their market share muscle, which, you know, maybe they've earned, but it, it was definitely a, a, a lot more uh, aggressive um, in the case of them versus Valve. But yeah, it's, it, you know, it, it, I'm OK if you say we don't want remote desktop. But when you say we're going to let remote desktop, but only certain apps, it's kind of like that's not remote desktop. Remote desktop is I control my desktop remotely. Either let me do everything I can do, or don't let me do everything I can do. I, I that's just I would love to hear what our viewers think about this because honestly, this is a contentious subject. I would love to hear because I'm sure you and I have expressed a couple of views. I'm sure there's about seven or eight different views we haven't even thought about that our viewers uh, would share with us. So please comment on the on this episode. We'd love to hear what you're thinking. Right. Well, and I'll just throw another thing out there too. Right. I, I guess. Part of where I'm viewing it from is technology enables assumption of something, but, but then there's an expectation that it that it is constrained when that is in conflict with some other licensing agreement, right? Like, I don't think that Microsoft would necessarily have a problem with it, but as a for instance, where can you view any videos that you've bought in the Microsoft store? It's the one platform where you can't watch that stuff anywhere except on a Microsoft device. Like th they don't have a video app for Android. They don't have a video. So that stuff isn't licensed. Like if I go and I buy justice league in the window store, I can watch it on my PC or Xbox period. If somebody already pees in right. And, and, and they get, the other thing is this is what happens when people talk too loudly, right, about something, you know, valve valve may not have, may not have ever asked. And this is the other thing that we, that we don't know is, Oculus may have asked this guy to pull the feature because Valve came over the top and said, hey, that's, that's not how we expect people to access our content. Um, but, you know, but that's my point is that, you know, if if Microsoft goes, hey, people are watching our licensed content that we only paid to for them to view on Microsoft Windows devices and Xbox, now they're viewing it on an, on a, on a Android device using this workaround, you know, and it's it's kind of like copyright. You know, you I can see how they might sometimes hit a point where they're they are obligated by law to say something um, rather than just turn a turn a blind eye to it. 
that's that's uh that's a very good point actually a very good point hey i want to move over to this kickstarter i ran into uh earlier in the week let me bring it up on the screen here um they only wanted fifty thousand. they got 107 already and they got 30 days to go um basically i won't play the video you can check this out but basically they put well this video is playing anyways you put a sensor on each foot and then one on your belt and you can walk around instead of having to use your joystick to move yourself you can walk around in vr and um i backed it because i'm like i think it was a hundred and just over a hundred dollars i'm like it's supposed to be out in august and it just looked cool it's like how often can you back a kickstarter when it's going to be out in two or three months and it's vr related under 150 dollars under 120 dollars so, I mean, but, it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> but I have to ask you, Gray, haven't, haven't you been burned by Kickstarter before? Um, I, I thought you had a couple bad Kickstarter experiences. Well, I, first of all, I had a successful <laughs> Kickstarter that I okay. ran myself that kind of launched okay. my company, which is okay. work-related, automation-related. But um, I have recently been giving the uh, the Descent folks and the... Uh, and the um, dual universe folks a little a little salt yeah. because these are three-year-old projects and uh, the dual universe guys are like hey we gave alpha and beta access to everybody because we're running long totally respect that the descent folks teamed up with little orbit i think it's a little orbit and um now now the game's like in limbo not because the descent folks were bad descendant studios they were they're great but um they they hooked up with the publisher and now they had a fallen out and it's like ay, 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 ay. so um, in any case um, there's even another we were talking about I think we were talking about the VR glove Kickstarter where they collected 150 thousand dollars from backers and never gave them anything including a refund and now they're selling their gloves which are supposed to be 200 dollar gloves for 1400 dollars are you kidding me? I can buy a car for fourteen hundred dollars. Give me a break. Well, a used car, anyways. But um, long story short, I mean, there's no guarantee when you back something on Kickstarter. We all understand that. But Cat is a known entity. They've made these VR treadmills. Um, you know, Kickstarter fails. Kickstarter will fail and become a non-entity if backers collect money and don't provide stuff. Right. right. End of story. I, I, I'm, I'm actually complimentary. I, it's 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 encouraging to see. I mean, like you said, like the the worst thing that could happen would be, you know, Kickstarter is a highly democratizing effect that allows a lot of people to bring things to market that that otherwise would never have been able to. The worst thing that could happen would be um, for people to have a bad Kickstarter experience and then go, I'm I'm I don't want to be part of that conversation anymore like i'm done with that model um so i so i think it's it's complimentary for, for you to you know have have experienced or seen things that you know went sideways but still be willing you know and and, and then just take the approach to just re-ratchet your criteria rather than just totally divesting yourself of, of participating in that market so and it's uh and it's cool yeah i i again I, I i don't pay attention to the kickstarter stuff but yeah what i want is you know, with if I'm going to play flight sims and race drive race uh, racing simulations and stuff, then I want the ability to, like I said, re reach my hand out and touch a control, right? Without yeah. uh, necessarily having to have the touch controllers in my hand if I if I have to play it with like a joystick or a gamepad or something. So good deal. Hey, I'm excited about this next story because I'll just pull it up on the screen here. Vader Immortal is not only coming into the Rift. You have a Rift S. I have a Rift CV one. It's also cross buy, which means I get it for free. I bought it on the quest, and and I enjoyed it. It was only forty five minutes or an hour, or whatever, and I haven't spent a lot of time in the lightsaber dojo. But um, yeah, that's the way to do it. You want me to stop buying from the Echo store, make it cross buy, so I can use it on both devices. Now, so my question to you is, as a Rift S owner, are you even tempted to pick this up for ten bucks? Um. Uh, no, and it has nothing to do with the. Um, the, you know, if uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit about where I am with the test. 
uh, later. Um, what I found most interesting about this game is I didn't realize this is this is actually Industrial Light and Magic. Um, I, uh, I guess a, a, a separate uh, team there that uh, that does virtual reality content. Um, I would assume primarily for stuff from the Star Wars universe. So uh, that is uh, that's pretty awesome. Uh, so you're, you're... I would say it's high quality. It was a high quality experience. I mean, it was. Um... I hate to use the term AAA, but it was it was in that realm of AAA. They did a great yeah. job. Kudos to them. The flow, I mean, it was just like what you would expect from a very well made game. Yeah, and that's and that's and that's what VR needs, right? Again, we go back to the upload VR E three showcase. Like my my problem with that is I couldn't. I'm not sure that there were any AAA games there, and if there were, it's it's hard for me to. But again, like I, I have tons of 30 minute, 45 minute under the visor experiences. If you want me to go big on VR, I, I need I need that experience that I feel like is, is a high fidelity thing that's going to keep me underneath the visor for a couple hours at a time. And, and let me get through a big, chunky single player campaign. Um, and we're just in terms of scale, we're just not quite there, um, you know, with with a large number of titles. So, no. Uh, but do you want to talk about? Uh, are we still are we still in the news section? I've lost track. Uh, or the next thing up is Halo. Okay. okay. What were you cool. have in your list? Uh, that's 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 what I had pulled up on my screen to talk right. about. Let me switch over uh, to the video here. It's um, it's from the ooh. website. So uh, tell us about this. You found you dug this out. Yeah. So apparently, <laughs> there's like a traveling troop of VR people running around the country. Uh, demonstrating a Halo-themed fan experience. Uh, this story sourced from VR Scout. Um, so uh, their first stop is in Orlando, Florida this summer. Um, and what it is is you're able to uh, go in uh, with kind of a, a, a fire team. And these this is one of these... Um, probably otherwise you would be playing this in an arena, but you're able to... Uh, I uh, use this with a headset and uh, a VR PC on a uh, backpack um, and go in and participate in uh, Halo uh, arena style combat. So uh, it's pretty neat. Um, the exact type of kind of hero experience um, that you would uh, like to play. Unfortunately, it sounds like the the players rendered inside um, the arena are legless. Um, which kind of takes away from the the Halo esque experience, um, but uh, but it's still pretty cool and, and definitely a, a, a technical feat. Um, will feature a variety of other exhibits and installations, uh, and I'm quoting this directly from the article, uh, including a Covenant themed escape room set aboard an alien ship, as well as a UNSC Pelican flight training simulator. Um, so so some some pretty cool things. I, what's weird to me is I don't understand what the play here is like, like why i mean there's there's no virtual reality implementation on xbox that we know of it's very strange to me that uh and i, I mean it, i also don't know like who licensed this and really who's doing it so i assume that this is a microsoft thing um but yeah this raises almost more questions than it uh, than it answers yeah, I mean, it looks really cool. My son's like, let's drive down to Philadelphia to do it. I'm like, not in your wildest dreams. This is not that cool. I mean, we went to Dave & Buster's a few weeks back, and I got to do that whole four-person co-op game that they have. They're not VR-related. Um, I'm like, it was cool for like five minutes. And I think this, it looks really cool. I'm not going to spend six hours in the car to experience this, especially there's no guarantee you'll get in. So, um, you know, I was talking about this over in Reddit. It's like, I would love Microsoft to get into VR, but they're not going to. And given the fact that they did the whole, you know, Windows Mixed Reality thing, um, you know, I bought an Xbox One X. They didn't do VR like they said they would. And I'm kind of like PC all the way. As a matter of fact, I was I kind of realized this today. You know, I'm not buying the next Xbox One because I already bought my next console that's called the Oculus Quest. And quite honestly, that's where that's where my mind at because I'm I'm all about VR these days because 
there's an immersiveness in VR that you just don't get from regular games. And, you know, we've been playing games since games came out, right? Since the com personal computer and, you know, home console came out. And this is just, for us, it's a new it's a new avenue of games. It's for some people, their new thing was the whole, you know, um, you know, um, battle Royale model. That doesn't interest me. You know, I'm more of a team player. You know, we, we played a lot of the, the battlefield over the years and I loved, I always was number one in the, as a medic reviving all the, all the guys, but, um, you know, yeah, VR is for me. Um, some people they'll be doing battle Royale and other things, but, um, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm glad they did this, but the fact that it's not going to be on an Xbox is kind of disappointing. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I guess I'm trying to think of all the coverage. Everything I've listened to, I haven't heard a definitive statement that there's no VR plan. Just that, uh, that it. I, that it wasn't coming to Xbox One, um, so I don't know. I mean, there's there's tons of possibilities out there. I would say definitely, you know, if Xbox is going to do it, and again, say what you will about Xbox about Microsoft, but like they are very, they are highly analytics oriented around making those investments, and a lot of times, that like like was the case with HD DVD versus Blu-ray. Microsoft was pivoting away from that while people were still having the argument, right? The, my, the war had ended because Microsoft had decided not to play and people was, were still arguing about HD DVD versus Blu-ray. And when the world woke up and turned around, Microsoft was already 500 yards downfield running towards digital content. Um, so, you know, it's they've, they've got something from a data perspective Telling them to that told them to not do VR on Xbox One. I I don't know what what the, what their plan is for this next thing for Scarlet that's coming. Um, but this seems to open up the possibility. I don't know why you do this. Um, you know, none of these guys I, that I saw in the video again. The, the 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 squad flashes by very quickly. The one headset that I saw was Vive. This didn't seem like a rah rah like marketing thing for Windows Mixed Reality. It's Halo, um, so definitely there's a side effect from just getting Halo out in the zeitgeist as you prep to roll out the next iteration in 2020. But I don't know. It, it, it gives me a sliver of hope that there's something in the wind, you know, for VR uh, on on the next console or even just on on PC in windows right a, a third competitor in the market to vive and and quest um i, th I think would still be a, a, a positive net positive effect yeah I, I i would love to see the halo mess chief collection support vr that would be awesome i mean they're going to be releasing it on steam if they can support steam vr i would play all those games again in vr <laughs> definitely um you know there's this little company, um, Omni, excuse me, uh, excuse me, I'm finding this cold. There's this little company, Omni, they also made VR treadmills like Cat, and they have this new kind of, uh, it's actually in, uh, Dave & Buster's in Austin, Texas. It's like a mini VR arcade setup. I'm, I'm gonna just going to uh, switch over here and roll the video, but I was really impressed with this. After we saw the whole Halo thing, I'm like... Um, this is cool. They got four of their little, you know, Omni treadmills. You can see people using them right now. And, um, you know, this, uh, it just looked like a lot of fun that this would be something you could plop down in a Dave and Buster's and, um, you know, just let people run around and, and, and to have some VR fun. And the fact that they're in these, uh, Omni treadmills, they can't really get that far, you know, because they're, they're, they're constrained to their actual location. But uh, this is an article from over on Road to VR. And I just wanted to share that because um, it looked really cool. Did you have a chance to see that that picture there of the article? It just looks like a cool little, I don't know, 20 by 20 or, or 15 by 15 space where you can do VR, you know? And uh, yeah. I'm like, I'd love to try that out myself. Yeah, what's weird to me is um, 
<laughs> people in Dave and Buster's tend not to be sober. So it's very curious that they would elect to put this <laughs> in the Dave and Buster's. Um, and I, I wonder if there's policy and, and process and procedure uh, for constraining, like, who's able to go in here and participate. But uh, but it's neat. Uh, again, David Musters, Busters is as mainstream as you can get in terms of uh, arcades, right? Because you really don't have coin ops around anymore. Um, so, so this is, again, not an insignificant thing for them to decide to plunk down the money to um, bring one of these things in to their market a million dollars was the kickstarter i guess behind this yeah i'll tell you what if i if i had the money if i won the lottery tomorrow i'd set a vr <laughs> arcade because i just think it's it just looks like a ton of fun speaking of a ton of fun i want to kind of work in this next story here now we all know well i think we all know that the the next super uber awesome steam sale is scheduled for june 25th like that's a leak, right? If you go to, if you Google, when is the next Steam sale? There's a site that actually tells you that. And if you leave that site up, I found out accidentally. If you leave that site up, when the Steam sale is about to start, it, it sings hallelujah. So don't leave it up at work. Um, in any case, um, even though the Steam sale is due on the 25th of, Ju of June, um, I wanted to say, let everybody know that one of our favorite games, one of uh, Live from the Oasis' favorite games, Furious Seas, which is so much fun, single player and the multiplayer wave version, is currently on sale right now for like uh, $14. So if you've been looking for a um, seagoing game, I mean, this is not Sea of Thieves, but um, it's a lot of fun, and I highly recommend it. You can see on the channel, we got three or four videos of us playing this. It's 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 definitely a blast. Highly recommended. Like you know all the games we play, we recommend. But um, I think I bought four copies of this for the team, so we could all play it. So uh, great game, and um, just want to let you know. Now that said, keep in mind that June 25th, the Uber Awesome Big Annual Sale on Steam is supposed to happen. So grab all those titles you've been waiting for. Because they should be on sale at their lowest point. Typically, the big Steam sales are, that's when everybody hits their low points. So that's it. That's all I had. Do we have anything else uh, to cover here? I think you had some, you wanted to talk about. Uh, I'll, I'll just talk very about that tonight. Um, so uh, probably the biggest thing, two weeks I'd say, um, I have pulled out my Windows Mixed Reality headset. I've been playing my Rift S, uh, and I've pulled out my HTC Vive. All three of those headsets from different manufacturers connected across different PCs have all had problems with the controllers um, to the point where the Windows Mixed Reality headset, I, I pulled out the wands, and I again had the same problem of them just refusing to connect um, to the point where... I that headset is over stuffed in a corner right now, wrapped up. I as of today I have no intention of ever pulling it out and using it again. Like after a year of struggling with that, like I'm just frustrated beyond all belief. The Rift S, um, good on Oculus, so they have rolled out updated firmware and updated drivers for the headset. I've experienced those problems and seen that hit and had an opportunity to test it. The, so the drivers and the firmware update that are designed to take care of the uh, screen blackout problem um, does appear to be taking, does appear to be working. I have, since uh, I updated to that, I have not had the problem of plugging in the headset um, and, and putting it on, or I actually, because I got tired of putting the headset on and not getting any video, I just started sticking my finger uh, against the light sensor to try and see if the screen will illuminate. So that works. I have not had any screen blackout issues um, since those drivers and firmware updates hit. However, just prior to those updates dropping, what I started experiencing was a vast degree of problems with the touch controllers. Now I play a lot of flight sims and racing games that require game control, game, game controller input. So Typically, my paradigm is I, I bring up the Oculus app. I, you know, get the controllers connected to the headset. 
I put it, I, you know, launched Steam VR. I put the headset on, I grabbed the controllers. I'm, I'm in the little room with the bank of game tiles in front of you. And all I use the controllers for is to launch the game that I'm going to play. I then tend to put them down on my desktop right on the edge, the leading edge of my uh, keyboard so that I can reach out and find them. And if I can't find them with the headset on, I can find them by running my hands along the keyboard. Then I play with the game controller for 30, 45 minutes or an hour. What I've been seeing, and this might be a problem with Steam VR, is then when I launch, so the controllers seem to work fine. When I launch Steam VR, I pick up the controllers the light beam is off from the, uh, I wish I had them over here, but I put the Oculus, uh, uh, the Rift S away. But, but if, if this is the controller, right, in the, in, and this is the halo circle, and the light beam is supposed to be lined up with that, what happens is, is the light beam has shifted to being, like, down here. And so it, like, comes off of, like, the, the index finger trigger, that's the first indication. Then when I put then I put them down. When I go to pick them back up 30 minutes later, um, they, and again, typically I, I sit them next to each other against my keyboard's edge, they are like stuck like that. Um, I pick them up, they don't move. Um, if you've ever noticed in the Oculus app, your hands have a little like light band around the end of them. That light band is gone. If I get out of, steam vr and into the oculus app what happens is the virtual hands are like upside down um and they and they won't come out of that position um if i reset so on several occasions i've had to completely repair and reset the controls i had to delete the device from the oculus app and repair and reset them even when they come up what happens is they are like right on either side of the headset and so I can't even see them. What I can see is when I move one of them, and I mean, I've got the controllers actually out in front of me, right? But where they render in the app in VR is right on the outside. And what happens is when I move them, I can see like the edge of the controller like flash into my peripheral vision. It, this has been happening now. It has gone from happening rarely to it happens all of the time it happens across multiple pcs it's happening on a pc where i just installed the oculus software with all the updated drivers and firmware this is not me this is not my pcs right this is a buggy poor integration with windows and or steam vr um that is causing that problem and again it had this week it got to the point where i had been streaming a lot of vr and it got to the point where in, in preps to go into a live stream, I struggled with the controllers for an hour just to get into Steam VR so I could launch the game. Um, and then when I got done with the game, then I had to futz around with the thing again just to get out. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Like I, I try to stream enough in a week that I don't have you know four hours to expend troubleshooting. Yeah. Controllers. Um. So 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 my Oculus is boxed up. My Rift S is boxed up right now. The Vive controllers. I mean, I, it never got that bad, but I have had a repeating problem where um, the right hand wand, like thirty seconds after I get into into Vive or in Steam VR, the right hand wand light beam just goes away and never comes back. It's boxed up too. I'm like, I, guys, I don't have I don't have time for this, right? This is these are four hundred dollar pieces of equipment. They are peripherals to one thousand dollar plus PCs. They should work. Mm. Um, you know, and it's not Windows Mixed Reality. You know, those sets go for two hundred dollars. It was all kind of a janky implementation. A little more forgiving of that, um, but like Oculus and Vive are supposed to be like the mainstream VR implementation, which is already a luxury in and of itself. Um, and it's at this point, it's just unacceptable to me. Um, if we weren't servicing the VR community by doing this show, quite honestly, I'd have boxed both of those things up and sent them back like this week. Yeah. Um, so, but other than that, um, you know, since I don't need the controllers to play, uh, I have been playing a ton of red out enhanced edition in VR, which is a, that, that is a vertigo inducing, uh, event, a great game. And, uh, a new game that came out called distance, um, which is you're driving this car, uh, kind of in a, uh, it feels like you're in kind of like in a Tron like universe trying to escape from, um, from somewhere, um, and uh, 
it looked a little simplistic when I first played it, but playing it a little more, it's a total of maybe like four hours of game time is what it's supposed to be. Um, Cause each level is like maybe five, 10 minutes. Um, but it's actually really awesome. And uh, it's almost like an endless runner, but it's in VR and it's in a car and it's not in a straight line. It's actually some very complex uh, routes um, and the physics change. So, you um the car you hit parts of the track where the car goes vertical um the car will barrel roll through uh um you know my my kids saw me playing uh saw some youtube video of me playing red out and we're like oh you're driving a roller coaster i'm like that's pretty much what it feels like um but on dis in distance is the same thing the car will actually uh roll uh, it, in some parts of the level it will detach from the road that you're on and drop onto the road below um, and the most thrilling part of the game is, um, the, and the whole thing is the thing has limited energy. So when you hit like the boost, it gets to a point where it overheats and then that goes away. Um, so when you, so sometimes you jump, um, and you have to have built up enough energy to cross the chasm. Um, and then there's cooldown time before you can use the boost again. Uh, but the most thrilling part of it, you, uh, will jump and then it has little winglets that it can deploy. But again, and when you do that in order to fly, you have to be hitting the boost. But again, you have limited energy. There are these rings you can fly through that will accelerate your cooldown. Um, so, so, but so basically, you have to you have to cross large sections of the map um, with no road. And the only way to do that is you have to conserve energy and cooldown and manage that on the way over. Because otherwise you won't you won't make the jump jump slash flight. So it's a really interesting game. Um, I want to say it was only like fifteen bucks, um, but you know for for that it's it's a really great VR physics puzzle um, to go through. I was highly surprised by uh, by the rewarding experience. So hopefully everybody will get their stinking controller drivers figured out and in a month or so. Creation level is down. I'll be able to go back to it. Well, and we'll try to get the links to both those videos in the show notes for today's video. Um, we also played, last week we played Carnage Chronicles. It was pretty cool because we made it to a new area. We made a new NPC. We took a whole boat ride. It was pretty interesting. Um, this week we played Trickster. We weren't able to live stream it because of the YouTube issues, but uh, I don't know what was wrong with YouTube, but um, that video will be up soon. We had a blast in that right up to the end where the bow started stopped working and then i played some apex construct i only got about 20 minutes in so really not more than what you would have seen in the videos uh, about it but uh you know just trying to use my quest and have some fun on that and uh you know do the whole room scale thing with that so um we'll try to include links to everything we have all the let's plays we have that are published in the show notes um and with that I don't know. Is that it? Do we have anything else? Yeah, man. I know uh, you wouldn't. I, yeah. I know you're being a true power. In the <laughs> with that cold. Yeah, I know. I keep yawning. And um, I just might apologize. To, I just apologize to the audience for the issues we're having and my yawning and having to keep uh, coughing and muting my mic. But um if that's it, Sir Aga, I'm going to go ahead and end the show. Did you have anything else, sir? Nope, nope, I do not. I look forward to being back next week. Yes, and hopefully I'll be over this cold. <laughs> so um, thank you, my good friend and co-host, Sir Aga. I'm Sir Gray. We love coming to every, coming every week here and talking about VR news and happenings. Please leave us some comments. Let us know what you're thinking because we enjoy reading your comments and hearing what your thoughts are because we know they can't be the same as us because we don't even agree. But with that said, I want to wish everybody a great week. Um, I'm sure you'll find a lot of things going on at Rounding Off Affinity in the E2KG network, which you can find links to in the show notes. As well as here on the Gamer Show, we have Elite Cast coming up. And I think next Wednesday we're playing Star Trek Bridge Crew again, which we always have so much fun playing. So with that said, just have a great week. Have a great weekend. Until next time, peace. <laughs>